Welcome, you guys. This is session number one, and it is actually spring break for me. So here I am at home, and uh, we're going to try and make this work. I hope the, the sound and the quality is good for you guys. Um, I'm sorry that you're not uh, on spring break. Some of you are. If you're a session, if you're on the main session, you may well be um, on spring break. And if you are not from the main session, then uh, you're probably online only. So uh, welcome to those of you who are here. If you are here live, you may um, answer, ask questions at any point in time that you want to. You can pop in and pop out of the session as you need to. Um, that's OK, too. I will be recording this session, and I will be posting the recording for this session uh, about half an hour or so after we finish. I'll get that recording posted for everybody. Uh, so you can do either. You can have some combination of life. You can come and go as you wish, ask questions as you wish. This is intended to be as um, as useful to you as possible. Uh, keep in mind that after every session, ever, uh, so we'll have six of these, uh, there will be, um, a, it's kind of a quiz where you have to watch this session and then answer questions about the session. So keep in mind that you will need to do that whether you're live or not live. Um, so if you want to take some notes, that's uh, a, a good idea as well. So first of all, I'm going to assume that some of you, this may possibly be your first class. So I'm going to kind of walk you through a couple of minor things. Um, forgive me for a couple minutes here if you're already familiar with all this stuff. Um, we'll be back to you guys about stuff that's specific to this course here shortly. Okay, so let's kind of go over here, kind of walk you through how this works. If you are new to Blackboard, which probably you aren't, it's a 300, you know, 3,000 level class, so probably you're not, so I'm going to do this really quickly. But it's always, uh, it, it happens sometimes, and I do have new people that have come from other colleges or whatnot, um, or maybe you've been on the main campus and you're just taking an online course and you're not used to this format. Uh, so keep in mind, we do have six modules. They are over here on your left-hand side. Um, think of them as six weeks. Each one is a corresponding to one week starting today. Um, by the time we get to module six, you will be finishing up and going off into summer. Uh, keep in mind, we have the syllabus and the schedule over here. Okay, course schedule is always up here. Um, you can kind of click on that print. Maybe you might want to print this out. Um, I'm not a real fan of how this is put together. So just keep in mind that the modules feel like they're kind of backwards. Um, so like, for instance, week one, module one, the actual first thing here is the live text session. So it's at the end. So we start here at the end on one end of the week, and then it kind of you kind of go back up here to work your way through the week. It is what it is, right? Um, so there's always, a, there's kind of a rhythm to these particular classes, but the first week is a little bit different as far as the rhythm goes, um, because you have this thing here, and that's, uh, first of all, meeting your classmates um, in the discussion board so that you're familiar with how that thing works. Um, and the other stuff here then are these sort of initial things that you have to do that are posts. But there's a most important thing that I wanna point out here, and this is this course preparation quiz. Um, there's a course preparation quiz for every online co uh, course that Indian puts together. Um, those have to be taken, guys, um, or they'll or they'll jump you out of the class because they'll assume that you're not participating in the class. So make sure that you have done that course preparation quiz ASAP. Okay, just because we don't want any miscommunications of people who are like, oh, but I am participating. I just didn't do the the course preparation quiz. You got to do the course preparation quiz. Okay. Um, I don't put this all together. I'm just facilitating it, but I can answer any questions that you might have about stuff. Um, if you have any technical questions, your computer isn't working, uh, things aren't working, like you're, you're using the wrong browser or you try and open something and it doesn't open or you're trying to attach something you can't attach, um, technical questions, IT stuff should be, you should call the IT department. Um, there is one located if you just call the main campus and ask for IT. Um, informational systems, you are going to get a live person and they'll walk you through how to make this all work, okay? If you have any course questions such as registration or dropping, I also don't answer those questions. Those need to go to the registrar. Um, so anything having to do with course content, I'm your person to ask questions about, okay? All right, so keep in mind that you have things due usually is on Thursdays and Sundays. So usually early in the week, and most of the time it's going to be on a Monday, uh, we will have the live tech session. And again, you can uh, attend live or you can watch it recorded. Um, and then the rest of the week sort of starts happening. 
the first things are usually due on Thursday. The second things are due the following Sunday. Okay. Um, I am going to be going out of the country, you know, late tonight. So that's why we're doing this session now, because I'm not sure, just not sure how the internet will be tomorrow. So this is a little unusual to do it on a Sunday, but um, we want to make sure that you guys can hear it. All right. So let's take a look at how this this stuff works now. If you have not taken an online course, I got to stop and pause and tell you um, it's not the same as a regular course. OK, uh, so there's lots of different forms of online hybrid live learn anywhere stuff or all over the place. Um, this particular one is intended to be done in six weeks, which really means that you are doing three weeks of work for every single week. OK, because a normal session is 16 weeks long. So you're doing approximately three weeks for every week. So that means that you almost are doing you want to do something almost every day or you're going to be behind. Um, so if you have not yet done so, pull out a calendar for the next six weeks and allot yourself timing. Um, usually students spend a, a decent amount of time per week doing this if they're going to succeed. Uh, you have readings, you have writings, you have responses. And, and there's a, just a lot of stuff going on that during the week that you want to be aware of. So, for instance, this particular week after this live tech session, notice that right above it is week one tech live reflection. That's the where you reflect upon what you're hearing and write something about it. What did you hear? What did you learn? Um, notice it's actually not due until next Sunday, but that's ridiculous, right? Why would you want to wait for that when you're listening to it early in the, the week? This, it's intended for you to listen to it early in the week, get an overview of what's going on, see some of the stuff and go, OK, I know what I'm supposed to do. Now let's go do it. Let's plan my week. Um, so I recommend that you listen to the tech session usually on Mondays and do the tech re live reflection on Monday. Get it off your plate, right? That's a good way to start off your week and succeed. Then you're going to kind of scroll back up here. Notice you're always going to go down to the bottom, take a look at the tech live, and then kind of go back up. Um, if you want to see when all the tech lives are, you can scroll down and find them. Um, so then you're going to kind of pop back up here and go, all right, now what do we do? Now that I have an overview, what am I going to do for the week? Um, notice that there's a this first week has more things than normal, right? Because um, you're introducing yourself to your to your to the class, to your students, and so on. So it actually does get a little easier after week one. This coffee, right? Um, so you're going to be doing syllabus and schedule, online policies, and reviewing MLA format. Some of you are familiar with MLA format, especially if you just came out of high school, you're familiar with it. If you are not coming out of high school directly in the last you know, five years or so, you may not know what MLA format is. So that might be a new thing for you to figure out. Okay, notice that this is always what you're going to have to do first. There is a post that's due in the discussion board almost every Thursday. So that's an initial post. So you, you, know, you usually have to do something before you post it, right? So you can't just wait until Thursday to do everything. Otherwise, you're going to have a really horrible Thursday, Friday, Saturday when everything is due. Um, so make sure that you are looking ahead and going, OK, what do I have to actually do in order to prepare to write that po discussion post? That's this stuff here, over here, the topics and readings. You're going to want to put some time for yourself to do the readings, you know, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, right? The beginning stuff, so that you're prepared for whatever it is you're going to do. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that that's really so. You're going to watch the tech live session, and then on Monday and Tuesday, you're going to be doing the readings. Then you're going to be doing the posting, the initial post. Okay, so you'll post uh, on the discussion board. I will show you where that is here after I finish going through the schedule, um, and then. The, now, notice that there's something else to do with the discussion board. Some people forget the second part of that. You don't want to forget that because it's half the points. Um, so the first session you're supposed to do by Thursday, and then you're supposed to post the discussion responses, those you know, you're reading your peers posts and just and commenting on them by, by Sunday. Um, that also is a date that I disagree with highly. Uh, if you want to succeed, you want to do it earlier in the week. Um, so posting by Thursday, starting your discussion responses by Friday or Saturday at the latest. So the idea there is that you, re, you know, you're posting something. Here's my thought process. Here's my early thought process. Here's what I'm we're gonna I'm gonna do before I write. And then you look at the other people's and go, oh, that's what they're doing. Oh, that's a really good idea too. Maybe I can incorporate some of their thoughts 
Maybe I can expand my own thought on how this works. So the discussion board is intended to help you sort of brainstorm the initial part of it and then you know, kind of bounce ideas off of one another. If you are waiting until Sunday, that doesn't happen because everything is due on Sunday. So if you're doing your discussion posts to your peers, first of all, it's not going to help you. And secondly, it's not going to help them, right? So post your stuff by Thursday and then do your discussion responses by Friday or Saturday. Okay. Just a, just a tip. All right. So going down again, notice you still have this reading stuff over here on the left. Then there's that course preparation quiz. It's due by the 19th. You know, that gives you one full week to say, Hey, I'm participating in this class, right? Which is the intention of that. Another thing you won't have to do once you get past week one, you'll be done with that stuff. Um, all right, I'm pausing to drink coffee. I don't know. You can't see me anymore, can you? All right, so then what else do you have to do? The main, the next major section of stuff is going to be due on the Sunday, right? So we have the first things due on Thursday, second things due on Sunday. Again, you don't want to wait until Sunday to do all this stuff because then you're going to have a really horrible weekend for one, right? So you have short answer questions to do, which means you've read the textbooks and then you're going to answer the questions. That's number one. And then secondly, there's a, a second one where you read something and then answer questions and then do the type the type, uh, tech lab reflection. So now, now that I've said all that and gone and kind of messed up your brain about everything, at least you have kind of a rhythm, but this class is not intended to destroy your love of reading. Let's put it there, right? We don't want you to hate reading and writing by the time we end this course. We want you to like them better. Um, so planning is one good way to make that happen for you so that you have time to sort of sit and enjoy the stuff you're going to read. Okay, so notice where I was just opening. That's syllabus and schedule over here on the left-hand toolbar, third one down. Okay, um, meet your professor, online policies. I'm not going to go through some of this. They're student resources. I am going to open that for you. Notice that there's a whole section for online students here, like, um, for instance, the online support help, right? If you need online tech support, there is your number. Uh, you might also know them by Win Network. There's academic support, such as uh, online tutors here. Uh, we also have it listed over here somewhere. Well, no, we don't. So you can list it here under academic support with the tutor.com if you want to you know, put a writing send it to the tutor, you can do it here. And of course, technical tools. Uh, by the way, if you have any problems, technical problems, almost uh, you know, a, a huge percentage of the problems are because of the browser. Oh, my coffee's so good, sad. Um, so here's my tip for you. On my laptop, um, I have several browsers. You don't have to have just one. If you're using a regular PC, you probably already have installed Microsoft Edge. Um, you can use that one. It's not so great with Blackboard. Um, you could use Google Chrome. That one works pretty well. Um, you could also use um, Firefox Mozilla. All of the, those two are the ones I recommend the most. Um, I have all three of them installed on my computer. So you can too. You can install more than one browser on a computer. Um, so if you're having trouble in one of them, then close it out and go the other browser and try it there first. Um, most of the time, or at least half the time, that will fix whatever issue you are having. Okay, so that's my tip for the day. Okay, so there's student success sources. Um, announcements, of course, you're going to see those. And announcements, I will try and always post here, but then also send them to your email. So for the three of you guys that still read your emails, I will send them there too. So you'll have stuff uh, that'll kind of be just tips. Like, for instance, I send something after this, um, like this one it says, welcome, and where do you find the weekly recordings? So this is important because it is not necessarily intuitive for like, if you're watching the recording, you're gonna, like to find the recording isn't quite so easy. So I will show you how to do that. Um, okay, so then of course, beneath all that stuff, you're gonna see all the stuff for module one, two, three, four, five, and six. And let's start with module one, okay. We are module one now. So you are officially starting. Um, and here's kind of an overview. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I will go through some of it. Um, the, the assignment order, the things we just kind of went over. Here's another 
listing of that order. Um, again, with my disagreements about some of the order, I recommend you plan the order based upon your own life, based upon what works for your calendar, what your work schedule, your kids, all that sort of thing. So, but make a plan. If you don't have a plan, this is going to spin out of control really fast, right? Okay, so then the, the most important things for you guys are always going to be the learning resources and the activities and assessments. Um, and I'm going to open one of these and I'm going to stop the sharing. I'm going to reshare this to make sure that you guys are seeing what I'm seeing. So let's again share my screen. If I, if I let it follow too long, um, sometimes it doesn't, it stops following. So every once in a while I will reach re okay there we go all right so module one activities and assessments so let's just kind of walk you through all the things i just talked to you about here's where you're going to find where you submit them okay again that very all-important course preparation quiz preparation quiz uh which again make sure that you know how this whole thing works um it's five questions it's simple you can do it the quiz multiple times if you really want to get it perfect um but it'll ask you to kind of review all the things that I'm telling you. So actually, you're getting today what you already should know about stuff to take that quiz. So take it today, right? Get it off your plate. Be done with it. Get the reflection done. Get this done today, and you're on your way, right? Easy stuff, and it gives you something to start with. All right, so then the next thing that is that discussion board, right? So I told you you have to do some reading to prepare for that. So here's what it looks like. Okay, so you're going to read something called Cathedral. By Raymond Carver. No, let me pause for just a second because I'm going to show you something. Some of you love to read and others of you really don't, right? So I'm going to show you something here. But One of the underrated okay. artists let me get through the ad stuff for a minute. You know, the internet is always ads. Okay. All right. So hopefully you can see what I'm looking at here. Um, this is, if you go, and I'm not going to play this for you today, unless we have time at the end, I might play a little bit. Um, but let's say you are not a real great reader or you enjoy literature, but you don't really like to read it. You can almost always go over to YouTube or audio or wherever you want to listen to it um, and find it on a video or a recording. So for instance, what you are seeing here now is a Cathedral by Raymond Carver, as read by James Naughton. So you can you can see that this is, I think this one's 40 minutes long. Not all of them are quite so long. Um, but if if you want to, to read it you or see somebody reading it or see it performed, some of the things are performed, um, there's almost always another option for you. Okay, so don't don't neglect the fact that if you if you're really not a great reader, hey, you can play it for yourself. Right. Um, in fact, when you're thinking about the literature in this course, I always encourage you to encounter it twice. Um, the first time, just sort of sit back as you're reading it and enjoy it. Right. Don't don't think of it as an assignment, but think about it as do I like this or do I not like this? Why? Um, and some of the stuff you're going to love and some of it you're going to hate. Some of it I hate, some of it I love. Um, sometimes I love something because of the frame of mind I'm in currently. Okay, so whatever's going on in my life, I love something. And then the next time I teach it, I think, oh, I don't like this one so much. So, you know, a lot of it has to do with what's going on in your life, right? Um, so, but first time you encounter something, just, you know, don't think of it as something that it's an assignment. It's it's a reading that we hope you find something to enjoy from, okay? So just, that's my first uh, tip on that. First, read it once, listen to it, then kind of look it through and go, okay, now what am I supposed to do with this? So I'm going to read or listen to it again. And then I'm going to take some notes or um, if you are like me, I'm kind of old school, I like to print things out and then I like to write on it, um, which we call annotation. You're taking notes on, and interacting with the text. Um, you will, the more you interact with the text in various ways, whether that's talking to it or writing about it or whatever it is you're doing, uh, the better you're going to understand the the text, the, the thing that we're talking about, right? So the... The questions here are, well, the tips that, the, that Indiana Tech is giving you. First, like think about it. What details do you notice 
that you thought were interesting, peculiar, or significant. Okay, so one of the questions they're going to ask you is, for the discussion board, name at least three details that you, that stuck in your head from this cathedral by Raymond Carver. Um, notice it's, by the way, it's about 10 pages of text, right? So if you're reading it, um, name at least three details and, and explain what impact they had on you as a reader. So what is it as you're reading along, you thought, huh, that's interesting, or I wonder why that's there, or wow, right? Okay, the next tip that they ask you that, to interact with is this last one. As you read, you should have also remembered that literary texts exist in time and that time changes. That's really important, right? Because if you've ever written something like a diary and then gone back years later and looked at it, you might have thought, what the heck? Was that really me? Did I really write that? Right? Because it's in time, right? You are writing something in this moment of time which may not feel the same tomorrow. So the same thing with any sort of thing that you're reading. Um, what, what's your sense then of when did this story take place? Like what makes you think, sometimes stories tell you, right? This is occurring on the first day of October of 1932. Sometimes it tells you, other times it doesn't. You just kind of like, is it the details? Is it the way people talk? Is it the fact that they don't have cell phones? What, like, what is it that makes you think about where and when this is occurring? Um, so that's important to think about too. Okay, so those are the things you're going to be writing about, right? So those three things under question number three are what you're going to post in the discussion board. Um, so a tip on the discussion board. Uh, this is not a tech writing class, but I am a, a tech writing teacher. For the most part, I often teach uh, communication for engineers, which is for Indiana Tech. Um, and I find that I started as a literary teacher and I've moved more toward tech writing because that's kind of where the world is moving, right? Um, it is really useful to your peers if you use a couple of easy ways of like of labeling things. So when you're when you're writing your discussion questions, if you can label them with like little headings, you know, so for instance, um, if you were to put a heading on this question right here, you might title it three details. Right, it doesn't have to be something long, it should be something very short, um, but your your peers will know exactly what you're talking about because they've read these questions, right? Uh, so just kind of what little headings and then your your thoughts on it. Um, by the way, the discussion board is informal, so I'm not gonna grade you on whether you have a fantastic, perfect grammar. I'm grading you on your interaction with these questions, your thought process, uh, it's brainstorming, so I assume it's uh, very informal. So that's okay to be informal as you're thinking through something. And then part two, this is what you have to do with your peers. So the one that I said, don't wait till Sunday, even though it's due on Sunday, this one is the what I would do, this part is what I would do by Friday or Saturday. All right, so you're gonna pick at least two of your peers, their, their comments, so they put some stuff down, also interacting with these same three things here. Um, you're going to read them and go, OK, what does this person say? Um, try and pick people that don't already have two people interacting with them or try and interact with everybody. Um, so look at them and then make some comments to them. So here's your thoughts. How might their initial reactions lead to one of the reasons for studying literature, which we'll get to? Um, perhaps uh, choose and quote one specific passage from why read literature. Those are things that you have to, to read, or why read literature or why study literature, two of your readings, and make a connection to the observations of your peers. So that means that you actually have to show that you've done the reading, right? That's part of your thought. You're going, okay, I see that you read this, these two things, and that you are utilizing the information from them in your answer, and here's what I'm seeing from it. Okay, so your responses, notice, are going to be about four sentences or longer, uh, at least four sentences or longer, to each of the two people that you're talking about. Okay, so you're probably noticing though, right, that there's a lot of stuff here. Again, I, I'm not kidding when I say that you really need to do something every day to make this class go smoothly and to really enjoy it, okay? And we do want you to enjoy it. Okay, so that's the discussion board, right? So we're still under um, module one activities and assessments. So I'm just kind of scrolling down. Um, there's two short answer things that you have to do for questions, right? Um, so you may want to actually start with these um, because they will inform your thoughts on the discussion board too. 
Um, so in this assignment, you will describe how to write about literature. All right, that may be something, I'm guessing none of you are English majors, right? So, because we don't have a whole lot of English majors. So probably most of you are, are like, I don't know why I'm taking this class, except that I have to for my major. Um, and I'm not an English major, so how am I supposed to write about literature? That's a wholly different thing than writing about like a research paper or, uh, you know, something about engineering, right? So writing about literature, you're writing about somebody else's writing, right? That's harder. So this, this uh, reading here will kind of show you some tips on how do you write about that? How do you write about somebody else's stuff? Okay, so that's your short answer question for assignment number one. Now, assignment number two is helping you to think through a good thesis statement. Now, you should already understand what a thesis statement is. That's the main idea of a writing. So most often you find uh, a thesis statement in the introductory paragraph of something, right? So it's kind of the, hey, I'm introducing myself and here's my main idea. Um, if you were walking into a party and, and you didn't know a whole lot of people and you're kind of looking around and going, oh, I don't know who these people are. I'm going to have to kind of mix, I mean, I'm going to have to find a way to talk, to talk to somebody. So you see somebody that's kind of a friendly face, right? And, and go, oh, I know that person. I'm going to talk to that person. And they're like, so you kind of walk over there and maybe it's been a while since you've seen them or maybe you don't know them very well. And so what do you do? You stick your hand out and say, hi, you know, I remember you from, or hi, my name is Sherry. Um, and of course, then the next question is usually something along the lines of, you know, what do you do or where are you now or where's your family or, you know, whatever. Those are introductory things, right? You're introducing yourself, you're giving some context. Um, and then sometimes it goes into a reason that you're there at the party, right? What's your purpose in being at this party? Well, I know the person from such and such a place, or I'm here to meet people or whatever the case is. The thesis is your main idea. So you usually have one no matter what you're doing, whatever type of uh, interaction you're doing with another human, you usually have some sort of purpose, right? Same thing with the writing. Um, so this writing here for number two is intended to help you think through how do you do that when you're writing about another piece of writing? Because that's a whole kind of different thing, right? So what they have you do is read four short poems, I Too, Barbie Doll, The Death of Ball Turret Gunner and The Road Not Taken. And by the way, of course, you can always go over here to Google. Hopefully this is following and click on videos and see, hey, look, we have several videos that are ranging from two minutes long. Well, let's take a look at this one. So let's say I don't like to read, but I like to interact with it. So I'm going to skip this in a minute, right? Yeah, we're going to skip these. The Here we go. By Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. 
Now, let me come back over here and make a couple of comments about that. So you notice that once you have clicked on a video and watched it, you have you have pictures of somebody else's thoughts in your own head, right? Um, you may not have envisioned the road not taken like that at all until you watch that little video. So keep in mind that it may not always be good to watch the video, but it is a potential possibility for those of you who are trying to interact more or visualize more um, with what you're reading. Okay, so those there's four short poems there. Okay, again, you're going to be doing this for this short writing assignment number two. Um, there are four of them. You will choose one of them, list and explain three details you thought were important um, in establishing a message or theme. So um, you'll be getting more thoughts on the theme when you do the reading. Make sure you do the reading first before you do this so you're understanding what the heck is a theme. I don't know, right? So there's, there's a reason for the way that the assignments kind of unfold. Um, I would do all the reading first before you start doing all this stuff. Okay. And the rubric. Rubrics, by the way, in this course are intended to really help you um, so that you can see what I'm looking for and that you can fix any issues before you turn something in. So you can write something, then look at this rubric and go, did I hit all of these things? Did I do this? Oh, I did. Okay, good. Okay. And the last thing, the tech live reflection, that's what you're doing about this. What did you get out of this? What did you hear? What are the things you remembered? Again, I would do this today and have that one done already. All right, so notice the good news is that you don't have any giant essays due this week, woohoo, right? You're doing preparation stuff. You're interacting with smaller pieces of writing. All right, now, going back over to module one, I opened up first for you the activities and assessments. Now I'm gonna go backwards up here to the learning resources. Okay, so these are the things we're gonna kind of look through. Um, first of all, we're going to open this module one lesson. And I'm only going to point out some, uh, some things on here for you to take a look at. You're going to want to go through this in a little slower, click through some of the things um, to help yourself get a feel for things. Um, I'm not going to go through all the cartoons that are great, but here they are. Um, this kind of tells you a short thing, and I'm going to start with this. What? the heck is literature for? So I'm going to open up this video and show you this video. Let's see if I can find it in my... We have so many things open that I have to go back and find them all. Sorry, guys. I think I have a little too many things open here. Let's see if I can find where I opened. Well, get rid of some of these windows that are open. Maybe I can find it then. Eventually, we'll find it, right? Ah, there we are. Okay. okay. There we have it. So let's listen to this little video. It's very short. Um, what the heck is literature for? A general sense that these sort of places are filled with things that are deeply important. But what exactly is literature good for? Why should we spend our time reading novels or poems when out there big things are going on? Let's have a think about some of the ways that literature benefits us. Of course, it looks like it's wasting time, but literature is ultimately the greatest time saver because it gives us access to a range of emotions and events that it would take you years, decades, millennia to try to experience directly. Literature is the greatest reality simulator, a machine that puts you through infinitely more situations than you could ever directly witness. It lets you safely, that's crucial, see what it's like to get divorced or kill someone and feel remorseful, or chuck in your job and take off to the desert or make a terrible mistake while leading your country. 
It lets you speed up time in order to see the arc of a life from childhood to old age. It gives you the keys to the palace and to countless bedrooms. You can assess your life in relation to that of others. It introduces you to fascinating people, a Roman general, an 11th century French princess, a Russian upper class mother just embarking on an affair. It takes you across continents and centuries. Literature cures you of provincialism and at almost no cost turns us into citizens of the world. Literature performs the basic magic of showing us what things look like from someone else's point of view. It allows us to consider the consequences of our actions on others in a way we otherwise wouldn't. And it shows us examples of kindly, generous, sympathetic people. Literature typically stands opposed to the fact that rewards money, power. Writers on the other side, they make us sympathetic to ideas and feelings that are of deep importance, but that can't afford airtime in a commercialized, status conscious and cynical world. We're weirder than we're allowed to admit. We often can't say what's really on our minds, but in books, we find descriptions of who we genuinely are and what events are actually like, described with an honesty quite different from what ordinary conversation allows for. In the best books, it's as if the writer knows us better than we know ourselves. They find the words to describe the fragile, weird, special experiences of our inner lives. The light on a summer morning, the anxiety we felt of gathering, the sensations of a first kiss, the envy when a friend told us of their new business, the longing we experienced in the train, looking at the profile of another passenger we never dared to speak to. Writers open our hearts and minds and give us maps to our own selves so that we can travel in them more reliably and with less of a feeling of paranoia and persecution. As the writer Emerson remarked, in the works of great writers, we find our own neglected thoughts. Literature is a corrective to the superficiality and compromises in friendship. Books for our true friends, always to have, never too busy, giving us unvarnished accounts of what things really like. All of our lives, one of our greatest fears is of failing, of messing up, of becoming, as the tabloids put it, a loser. Every day, the media takes us into stories of failure. Interestingly, a lot of literature is also about failure. In one way or another, a great many novels, plays, poems are about people who messed up, people who slept with mum by mistake, or who let down their partner, or who died after running up some debts on shopping sprees. If the media got to them, they'd make mincemeat out of them. But great books don't judge as harshly or as one-dimensionally as the media. They evoke pity for the hero, and fear for ourselves, based on a new sense of how near we all are to destroying our own lives. But if literature can really do all these things, we might need to treat it a bit differently to the way we do now. We tend to treat it as a distraction, an entertainment, something for the beach. But it's far more than that. It's really therapy broad sense. We should learn to treat it as doctors treat their medicines, mm. something we prescribe in response to a range of ailments and classify according to the problems it might best be suited to addressing. Literature deserves its prestige for one reason above all others, because it's a tool to help us live and die with a little bit more wisdom, goodness and sanity. Okay, that said it better than I did, what literature is really for. Now, there are two things I want to touch on that are in the learning resources in the lesson. Um, one, there are two videos here, uh, MLA format, right, what it is, and in-text citations. Both of those are very short um, two-minute or three-minute videos. Um, if you are not familiar with MLA, you're going to be doing everything in this course in MLA format. The MLA stands for Modern Language Association. It is intended for people who uh, are working in the humanities, such as English. Um, so some of you will go on to be engineers. You might use IEEE format. Some of you will be in business. You'll probably use more like APA. But in this course for the humanities, you're going to be using MLA, which is generally the first format taught in high school. So you probably are familiar with it. But if not, please make sure you go back and check out these videos. They're located in the learning resources lesson. Okay. Um, there's a few other things here. Again, another folder here, resources for MLA formatting, if you need to look anything up. But 
going to spend the last 20 minutes of class here with another video that's found in that learning resources. And that here is how literature can change your life. So before I put that on, because this is uh, 19 minutes long, before I put that on, does anybody that is here live have any questions so far? Okay, then the last uh, 20 minutes, we're gonna play this and then our course will end and you guys can do the reflection and carry on with your week. So here we go, this is kind of cool. I love this one. Thank you very much. It, it's an honor and, a, and a, a, a really a thrill to be here. And thank you, Scott, for that kind introduction and correct pronunciation of my name. I'm very impressed uh, as an Italian. Are there any other Italians in here? Great, the rest of you can leave. <laughs> No, no, you, you can stay. Uh, you know, speaking of Italian, I'm, I'm reminded as I give this talk, um, in some ways um, uh, it's kind of strange that someone like me should give this talk because I actually grew up in a house with no books. Uh, my family were immigrants, very smart, hardworking people, Italian immigrants. Uh, and yet, you know, they didn't really have education, they had a, a grade school education. And so uh, whenever I would be sitting reading, you know, my mom would come up behind me and say in her Calabrian dialect, Giuse, that's su libre, te va mal a la testa. Joe, put that book down, it's going to give you a headache. <laughs> so reading in my house, you know, brought on migraines, that was the theory. I listened to my parents in almost everything um, except really for that. Uh, uh, it was a great thing about my family, you know, they kept you humble. I'm one of six kids, and when I, I got my first job after graduate school, I said to my mom, you know, I, I got a teaching job. I was a visiting professor at Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and I said, Mom, you know, uh, finally, I, I got a job at l'Università della Pennsylvania. I even said it in Italian. It was founded by Benjamino Franklin, founded by Ben Franklin. I said, you know, it's Psyche, do you know who Ben Franklin is, Ma? And she said, that's me, the figlia. No, so nemmeno che cosa ho fatto per colazione. Leave me alone, my son. I didn't even know what I had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> that's how impressed she was that I taught at Penn Franklin's University. Um, but, you know, so it seemed very natural and, and organic in a way for me to become a, a professor because I, they, they didn't have a great, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of books in our house, but there were a lot of stories. Uh, I grew up with a storytelling culture. Maybe many of you have as well, you know, these great stories about my, my grandfather on my mom's side who had come to America as a grave digger, uh, served in World War I and enabled my mom to get citizenship. And she came alone to the United States without the family, without her poor children in Italy and established the family. And my dad who would work two jobs, getting up at you know 3.30 in the morning, working 16 hour days. These were the stories I grew up with. And so when it came time to choose a career, it seemed real and organic to pick something that combined both stories and my love for Italy and love for their culture. So I became a professor of, of literature and also Italian studies. Uh, so I never really questioned the path that made so much sense. And then something happened exactly really 12 years ago um, in November 2007 that changed everything. Changed everything for me personally, but made me ask this question about literature, how it can change your life. You know, what, what the impact is. And so I went to teach a class at Bard College where I'm a professor. And the morning started out like anything, any other, you know, any other class day. And I walked into a 10 a.m. class. I was joking with my students. And I saw a security guard at the door. And my immediate thought was, I've done nothing wrong. Uh, so I'm joking. You know, I said, look, they're coming to arrest me. And I'm laughing. And I noticed that the security guard wasn't laughing. And he said, are you Joseph Lutzi? And I said, yes. And I knew in an instant something terrible had happened. So I raced out of the building, uh, past the uh, uh, vice, you know, vice president of the college, running up the stairs to get me. A van was waiting, and I heard the words which would change my life. Joe, your wife's had a terrible accident. And um, my wife, Catherine, at the time, um, had just had a fatal car accident. And so I left the house that morning at 8.30. By noon, I was a widower, but also something else. Catherine was eight and a half months pregnant, and she delivered the child. Emergency cesarean, and the baby was healthy and made it 45 minutes before she died. So in one morning, everything changed. 
And this is this talk's not about me. It's not about you know this great uh, tragedy that I went through in the road to recovery. But something happened that was really unexpected. Um, as part of the road back, I turned to something that had really been part of my professional life. I turned to a book that I had spent years studying, Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, Dante wrote 700 years ago. Couldn't be more remote, right, from us. And yet, for the first time, even after studying him for decades, I heard his voice the way I'd never heard before. I heard him describe exile. Dante spent the last 20 years of his life in exile, roaming essentially, you know, the medieval version of, of castle surfing <laughs> from one uh, castle to the next, looking for work, always on the run. And I learned from Dante these words in a dark wood. Um, in the middle of our life's journey, I found myself in a dark wood. In el mezzo del camin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. I felt that I was in the dark wood, uh, Dante's dark wood. This book resonated with me, this universal space of human suffering. And what did Dante teach me? I used to think it was what lands you in the dark wood is what defines you. But in truth, I came to see that it's what you do to get out of the dark wood that defines you. And I also learned something else. Dante wrote his great work after his exile, the Divine Comedy. He was rumored to have even perhaps contemplated suicide. We don't know. We do know that he was absolutely devastated by the loss of his hometown. And I felt that. I felt the loss of my own former life. And I wanted my life back. And Dante taught me, you can't get it back. You have to rebuild a new one. So my journey with this book became part of my journey back to the living. And it made me ask a question that I want to ask you today. What is it about literature? What is it about great writing? These books that stand the test of time that can change our lives. Why? Why did someone, why did I turn of all people to a poet who wrote 700 years before I did? And what can you do in your own lives? to make literature, great writing, great books, a part of your own everyday life. That's the mystery that I want to explore to you today. And what I'd like to do is, as a, uh, almost my scientific, I'm not a scientist, but you know, I'm a literary scholar, so I want to give you my take as a scholar, as someone who spent his life studying and reading, what it means to be, what these books do. I want to tell you five things that I think are the magic of these books. Okay. The first one is this idea of alternate worlds. Okay. I love F. Scott Fitzgerald's hair. Uh, you know, you've got to love the part down the middle, this old 1920s hairstyle. But F. Scott Fitzgerald, who's read The Great Gatsby? Many of you have. It's a, you know, I love it. It's a, it's a classic. It's accessible. The story of Jake Gatsby, the bootlegger who's in love with Daisy and tries to win the girl and eventually by the end of the book loses his life. It's an extraordinary story. Um, why do I bring it up and this passport to alternate worlds that I think great literature gives us? Because I want to tell you, I grew up in a working class family, an immigrant family. We couldn't travel. We didn't have money. But my town had a library. And in books, you can go anywhere. I remember reading about Renaissance France by this French author, Rabelais. I couldn't travel to the real France. But through this writer, I could go to France. And I could go back in time. Literature brings you all throughout the universe, and it connects you to worlds that happen even before you. When I think of great Ga the Great Gatsby, I think of scenes like these parties that Jay would throw at West Egg. I'm sorry, in, in, in the you know in East Egg, in the the West Egg area, where he would have mansions, and he had gotten everything in life materially he could ever hope for, and yet the way Fitzgerald describes it, he says. Girls were putting their, women were putting their uh, heads on men's shoulders in a puppyish way, you know, but no singing quartet formed around Gatsby. When I read passages like that, I'm back in America of the 1920s. I'm in this alternate world. I'm in a world, more importantly, of Jay Gatsby, the man who got everything he wanted materially. And as a friend once said to me, don't wish for something too much. You just might get it, <laughs> right? He got it and he realized his American dream wasn't what it was cut up to be. 
as I tell my students, literature is like a, this fossil of people who lived in a different time, you know, like a fo an imprint of a fern and a rock. Literature gives you the way people thought and felt. A history book can tell you about the 20s in America, but can it recreate the atmosphere like the Great Gatsby? Do you see what I mean? This idea of creating an alternate world that literature can do, which leads to number two, right? If literature can create alternate worlds, right, it can also bring us into the area where fiction almost becomes fact or truth. This is a painting by another nice Italian boy like Dante, Raphael, uh, the School of Athens, right? And you see Plato, the great philosopher, pointing up into the heavens. Plato saying, truth is up in the heavens. There is everything we see in real life is a simulacra. Beauty, justice, humans can never know that. We're too imperfect. We live in the land of the cave, the shadows on the wall. We have to use philosophy to try and arrive at some sort of notion of extraterrestrial truth. But on his right, I'm sorry, on his left, you see Aristotle pointing down to Earth, the Greek philosopher, saying, no, Plato, we only know what we see on Earth. I think of Aristotle as a patron saint of literature because literature tells us what we see on Earth, describes it. It knows we're imperfect. We don't have access to perfect truths. So Aristotle wrote, history tells us what happened. It is the specific, the contingent, the one-off event. Literature, poetry, epic, gives us the universal. It gives us the could have, the should have, what you know, that it extrapolates from the particular into the universal. So think as I tell my students, literature is the opposite of fake news. Fake news pretends it's true and tries to manipulate you into believing it. Literature is imaginative, tells you that it is, and then leads you to the truth in this way that Aristotle described. Think of Hamlet by Shakespeare, the, one of his most famous plays. You know, Hamlet sees a ghost. Who's going to believe a ghost? Maybe he had too much to eat the night before. <laughs> Maybe it was indigestion, and his dad says, Hamlet, you must avenge my death. Hamlet doesn't, he wants proof, right? Where does he get his proof? Do you remember the scene when he has Claudius stage? He has a play performed for Claudius the mousetrap and the murder of the king, Claudius, who had killed Hamlet's father, his uncle, Claudius is his uncle, sees the play and runs off. The play is the thing in which I'll catch the conscience of the king, right? That's an imaginative situation that leads to the truth. And that's what literature does. When I read of Dante's exile, sure, it's autobiographical, but it's a poem. Who knows if everything happened the way Dante exactly described it. But it was so real, it was so truthful that I could imagine myself into it. In a way, it's the opposite. Literature teaches you to ask the right questions. It won't provide all the answers. And books that do provide the, all the answers aren't being honest because there's some things that there's no answer to. There's no rule book for getting over the death of a spouse or raising a child on your own, okay? Um, the third thing I want to talk about is universal connections that come with literature. We live beautifully in an age of multiculturalism. We celebrate ethnic identity, and this is all great. I'm 100% behind this. I also think we should think of the things that connect us as people. What do all people share, right? This is a painting by Botticelli of St. Augustine, who lived 16, over 1,600 years ago. He wrote the Confessions in 398 A.D., if you went back to 398 AD, that would be like landing on Mars, right? You know, the average life expectancy was in the 30s. Uh, literacy was so low. Uh, I think they had uh, only dial-up internet. Nah, no, just kidding. Uh, so you're talking about a totally different world. And yet Augustine wrote the memoir that is still the template for today, his confessions. Augustine was addicted to the life of the flesh. You could almost say he was addicted to sex a little bit, right? He was addicted to glory. He could almost say he was a workaholic. These are very familiar patterns, right? I mean, you know, Keith Richards ain't got nothing on Augustine for his autobiography. So this model for an autobiography, you can trace back 1,600 years, and it's still relevant. I find that miraculous. I'm reminded of that scene in L.A. Story where Steve Martin says, you know, see that building over there? It's over, almost, you know, it's over 20 years old. Wow. 
this book is 1,600 years old and it still makes sense. It speaks to something that's universal in us. After the death of my wife, I needed to know that I wasn't alone. Other people had been through it. And I found that universal connection. The fourth thing I think is reading is a ritual. This is Machiavelli, a not so nice Italian boy, right? <laughs> you know, he wrote The Prince. He wrote this book about um, political brinksmanship and gamesmanship. Sure, we know that. But he also loved literature. And when he was exiled from Florence, he would describe reading like four hours a day, getting, he says, I put on my best clothes and I go into a study where I'm lovingly received by ancient men in there. It's that, that ritual of reading. Something happens when we read. If I gave you a, a, a book right now, some of you are carrying them. It's just symbolic notations on a page. You, I always tell my students, you're the co-author. You bring the book to life. Each writer needs a reader. Reading is that ritual where something profound happens, where it can literally change your life. And the last thing I'll say is the power of stories. What is it about stories? Yuval know Harari in his book, Sapiens, which some of you may have read, says that that's really what distinguishes us from a lot of other creatures, our ability to tell stories, to bring people together through narrative. The power of narrative. We're, we are a storytelling species. I think it's just as important as the opposable thumb. It's what's made us what we are. Think of Shakespeare, the story of, of Othello, the famous story of Othello. He's an outsider in Venetian society. He's you know, considered old, he's probably in his 40s. It wasn't the new 20 back then, right? And he's married the, the most eligible woman in Venice, Desdemona, right? She'd have her own show, Bachelorette, right? <laughs> And people are accusing Othello of bewitching her. And you know what Othello says? He says, her father often invited me basically to tell my life story, to hear these things with Desdemona seriously inclined. She felt compassion for them. And I did love her for it. Desdemona falls in love with Othello because he's a storyteller. And Shakespeare destroys all the prejudice surrounding Othello through the power of story. Once you hear someone's story, you can never think of them as a category or a group. You have to see them as a human being. For that reason, we need stories more than ever today in our society, our, our divided society. How can you make these five riches of literature your own? I think it's easy or practicable. I created what I call the rule of fours, okay? And I always think of my father when I do this, because my father was not a reader, but boy, could he use language. He would say things like, uh, you know, uh, nova tuo venire, may a new harm befall you, or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, these crazy poetic King Lear-like curses, to vos chupare la faccia nu and may a dog rip your face off, you know? <laughs> he was a real poet in his own way. Um, it's, he wasn't a reader. How do you become readers? Very simple, my rule of fours. Think of it like working out or walking or getting good night's sleep. Four days a week, 45 minutes a day. Four different books. One, your favorite kind of book. Let it be uh, romance, uh, Harry Potter, and whatever, anything, gardening, whatever. Your second category, contemporary writers. Who are the writers today, the fiction writers, changing the conversation? The third group, Nonfiction doesn't have to be made believe to be literature. In the fourth group, let one of those categories be a classic. Your Wordsworths, your Nietzsche's, your Virginia Woolf's, your W.B. Du Bois's. That mix of four will bring you the greatest glories of reading. And it will bring you to what my favorite writer Dante called that thing that, that connects all readers. Long study and great love. I want to close with an image. As I raised my daughter after those years, it took, it was very hard. I needed a lot of help from my family after my wife's death. What really brought us together more than anything, I look back, is when we started reading together. And I went through all of Harry Potter with this girl. <laughs> and I felt by the end, in that space of long studying great love, we were becoming a family again. Thank you so much. All right, you guys. I hope that you have a fantastic day. Let's get rid of this before it plays again. Okay. Are we
week today is over, and it's been a pleasure to have you guys here. There we go. And that's the end. Bye-bye.